This is smithy.tv. Uh, so we're on. Uh, I'm Jeremy listening, watching Five Questions with Jeremy. Today my guest is Warren Sonoda. Hi. I said you Hi. look anywhere. Yes. So yeah, I feel like I'm in the Matrix right now. <laughs> really? Yes. It's not even close to being the Matrix. No, it's not. It, we got I know. It's just banners held up with tape and yeah. This is this is high tech down here. This not is bad. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's better than my uh, my you know my bathroom, <laughs> which has which, great, which great is where you invited me to, and I, I passed. And Warren said no. Yeah, no, no. When I when I asked him back, I said, "Call wait. me when you have a table and some mics." Yeah, in a basement. Yeah, <laughs> and a small little potty that you can. That's the toilet. Is, pot. Yes. That's the toilet in case we have to. Exactly. In case we go along. Um, so we're here to interview. We're yeah. For five questions. We're just chatting. Um, <laughs> you were one of the guys that um, I remember seeing ham and cheese in Hamilton. And wow. I can't remember what At it was the movie called. Palace. Yeah, the movie. Is this still there? Oh God, I don't know. They were going out of business when we premiered. When you premiered there. there? So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't imagine it's still there. But so that was right. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe movie palace. Check it out. In Check Hamilton. it out. It's, it's a fantastic there. theater. It's a really cool. Yeah. They've got like, fire, like fake fire flames and it's, in the it's, areas. It's like an Egyptian temple sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. But I saw it there. Like, what was that? That have been ten years ago. That was uh, ten years ago. No. Yes, ten years ago. Two thousand less, maybe four, actually. Yeah. So nine years. It was ago. right before I moved to the city, and I right. and I think I had a friend that worked. Did on you it, we move to Hamilton? No, no, no. I, I, I'm from a small town that's about south of Hamilton. Okay. And it was just. Because I was gonna say, what the fuck were you doing in Hamilton? How was <laughs> <I'm laughs> <in> <laughs> um, A friend of mine, I think, worked on some of your music videos. Okay. Um, and so that's a how, nameless friend that we won't talk about. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so he said you should, you know. So we kind of went out, and then and that was well. A lot of people from the music video. Um, I, I was at a place called Black Walk. We all made a movie, and it turned out to be Ham and Cheese. So there's a lot of people that came up through the music video ranks to to do Ham and Cheese, <laughs> make a feature, and then Phil the Alien and all that kind of. Uh, yeah, Phil. Phil happened in around the same time as Ham. Actually, we we had finished the cut of Ham and Cheese. Um, uh, was we were politely um, we screened it for TIFF, but at like a three hour cut. <laughs> okay, please. Yes, that's um, amazing. I learned a lot. You should really <laughs> show it on Vimeo on demand. I don't. I don't think we. I, Do you have it I wouldn't inflict that on my worst enemy. Anyway, and then and then uh, Rob was doing Phil around the same time, and then. Um, um, I went in to do some cutting with him uh, after that. So it was, a, it was a really, it was a great, it was a watershed moment for everybody at Black Walk because we had these movies that were... Well, you had kind of like a collaborative, right? Kind of, yeah. It was, uh, you know, uh, Stefanik was doing his thing and he's always been uh, so fucking cool getting on the, the, the rock and roll, you know, the Suck. Have you I seen love Suck? Suck, yeah. Suck was so good. I mean, Phil the Alien was fantastic, but Suck was sort of the maturation of, I think, what the, he was trying to do thematically. With Suck was the, great. Yeah. I mean, it looked great. Yeah. Story-wise, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And there was a whole bunch of people that came to Black Walk. Jeff Renfro, who just did The Call of Me, um, Stephen Scott, Lisa Mann. Uh, it's like a mini Pixar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Chris Lefko. There was, a, there was a lot of great directors that came in and out. Javier, uh, who, um, who's a fantastic commercial director, he's getting his movie up and running. So there was a lot of people that came out of that. And what was like? What was it like? I've never been hip enough to do a music video, <laughs> but and you've done like a million, right? I've done a million and six. A million and six. <laughs> so what was it like? Go. I mean, how was it even getting into that? Like, was that because you knew bands or how? You know, when I started in the nineties, I'm dating myself now. I don't feel old. I was old as fuck. <laughs> you know, when I when I look back at you know, you go on YouTube now, yeah, which yeah, yeah. didn't exist when I was a. Uh, a young filmmaker, and you you kind of look at what's out there, and then you'll you'll find an old thing you've done, like an old video or something from like 1995, and you go, oh my god, that looks so dated. Yeah. Like it's so it's so of the it's 90s. Cool. Yeah. You know, grunge and, um, but I happened to be failing out of Ryerson Film School just at the exact time that the music video industry in Toronto was having a golden age. So that was like 94, 95. And then by 1999, we were in full swing. It was like crazy. The work, the, the bands, um, what, the work we were doing. Uh, at one point, I think Black Walk had like 20 or 25 directors on the roster. So I'd literally just walk in every week. We, we owned um, 99 Sudbury, you mm -hmm. know, the yeah, yeah. throw it raves and stuff there. We used to have like a booze can there or something. Um, you would walk into the, because there was a, 
a studio there, you'd walk in every week and be like, what are you doing this week? Oh, it's a Headstones video. It's a Wild Strawberries video. It's a Trouble Charger video. And, and this the amount of work um, for... I mean, I was in my 20s. Yeah. To, to be around that, that was my film school. So you're like a kid in the candy, in the candy it, it really was. And, it you know, technology still wasn't where it is now. Yeah. So we had to shoot on film. The, the money had to be there to do that. Um, um, we didn't get paid well, but we got paid... We worked a lot. And you're amassing a shitload of... of of experience I, and and not only that uh, amassing a network of really cool people yeah that to this day I'm, I'm friends with and I work with and I, I call you know the the collective you know filmmaking mass that I'm a part of so yeah it was it was a great time but I, I, I literally happened into it I mean I, I um for one of the uh, uh, exercises at Ryerson did you go to film school I went to Niagara College I'm sorry that's okay are you okay? I'm, I'm okay now. It's been a while, <laughs> so I've recovered from it. Um, yeah, we uh, we had like some sort of end of year thesis project we were supposed to do. So I did a, a music video for my friend's band uh, called The Misunderstood, and uh, Kevin Spencer, who is the lead singer. There was a group of us at, in Hamilton that went to um, Hill Park High School. Right. And Jason Jones was part of that, uh, who went on to do a Daily Show, and and he's in Ham and Cheese and and. Yeah, Cooper's okay. camera. Um, where am I going with the story? Anyway, uh, I did this really small little music video for a friend of mine that I actually paid for myself because it was my thesis film. So I sp- spent like four, 400 bucks on, we, we shot it on 60 millimeter black and white film. And um, it eventually got light rotation on much music, nice. which uh, at the time was amazing. Uh, because I was still in school. And, yeah, then, and you had a video on, on national television. It was, it was great. And then... Um, uh, it was funny because I failed four, I think I failed four of my subjects that year. and No, I failed every single subject that year. You're banished. And, and the, the, the same week that I got the letter from um, Alvino Saro, my tech teacher, basically banishing me from Ryerson Film School, I get a letter from Alvino Saro saying, congratulations for winning a CanPro Gold Award. For do, you have them, do you frame them side by side? I have it somewhere, yeah. I, I have should it put them side by side and frame them. I should. I should put it in my bathroom, and then we can do web, web, web yeah, episodes. Yeah, we can do that. That's fine. Yeah. So that's how I got into uh, uh, music videos, was kind of just um, doing stuff for friends, and it was the Wild West where... We put that video out, and then I got a call out of the blue from a, a manager of a band in the west and the east coast from Halifax, and uh, Wayne O'Connor, who's a fantastic manager, and he just said, um, "Dude, I just saw your music video, Much Music. Um, I got a band. I'd love for you to do their video for them. Um, we only have fifteen thousand dollars. Is that cool?" And I'm <laughs> like, "Yeah, I think so. Exploded. Yeah, for sure, man. It's like we can do a feature. Yeah, I, 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 I think I mean, I th- you only have fifteen. I think we can do something. Well, yeah, we can make that work." Um, not but, knowing how much. Yeah, but I mean, the '90s was the time when you know the the average music video was fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Hundred thousand dollar videos weren't uncommon. Yeah, but you didn't know that, so you're going in and going, "This is." The yeah, no, but but <laughs> as we got into it, um, um, especially the group of, of filmmakers I was with at Blackwalk, we just we started to do a ton, a ton of really cool videos, and then from Blackwalk, a lot of uh, the, the people there uh, branched off and they started Two Three Five Films, which is the company I'm with now. So. And I still do videos. I mean, the first thing I want to do after doing a movie is a music video. Is that just like one day. the palette? Oh, yeah. It's one day. I have great clients. I have fun doing it. Like, it literally is, is a way to just play in the sandbox and mm-hmm. not worry about a you know, 25-day shoot or a 15-day shoot of having to get everything. You just go out and... And you're not necessarily worrying about continuity or your story. No, you're about. worrying about, you know, does it look good? Does it, does it, does it make the artist look cool <laughs> you know, yeah, they yeah, just yeah, want to yeah. look cool well it's a different it's a completely different kind of um, discipline right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in that way mm-hmm. and it's great for um, now for up and coming filmmakers because the, um, the technology is there you know you literally can go out with, for no money and make a music video that looks like it's a million bucks mm-hmm. <coughs> doesn't mean you're going to make a living I mean that's the other thing is in the 90s we were we were doing pretty good and now the shift and, and everything that's happening and you're your guests on the show are probably talking about it is, you know, how do you monetize the internet? How do you make this all work for itself yeah. so that the, the amount of time and effort you put into something gets repaid on some sort of, you know, living scale? Yeah. How do you, how do you fight with free? Yeah. And they'll figure it out. 
Yeah. They're going to have to, or else, you know. Although there's, there's no entertainment. Yeah. You know, it was like that article that came out in Variety a couple weeks ago with Spielberg say, basically the, saying... The implosion of uh, yeah. Blockbuster. And that's Spielberg. There was, <laughs> there was actually a, a really interesting article. I forget. It, it was a... Uh, I don't know if he was a filmmaker or whatever. He's talking about uh, how the internet ha- is, is basically um, making uh, artists irrelevant in that, you know, when Kodak was employing 100,000 people... There was a premium on what they were doing because there was a value put for photographic imagery. Mm. But now that you you don't need any of that, uh, how you know how are all these um, highly trained people or or not artists? How how do they go out and make their living doing their thing? And that's that's going to be the the talking point for the next I think five years, five ten years. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, that's very serious though. You want to talk about sad. something funny? Something yeah. <laughs> Farts and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. um, so, what was it like for you to go from music videos? And, and I mean, Ham and Cheese, I guess, was, was meant to be an experimental project. Ham and Cheese was meant to be a retaliation to everybody saying you can't make a movie. Everybody goes through this, right? Yeah. Like until you make that first feature, you're not allowed to make a feature. You will go and try to get features made. And at the time, we were uh, I had some writing partners, and we'd be writing, um, you know, million, two million, five million, ten million dollar movies, not knowing any better. Yeah, and uh, when you're young and making movies, you feel um, you feel like you're the, the man is getting you down, the establishment is fucking you over, and this, that, and the other thing. But what I I think what I realized um, as I went through the whole process of it is, you know, the powers that be that greenlight things, whether it be a network for a television show or a studio for a film or or um, the funding agencies like OMDC or Telefilm or whatever. Um, they they only have a limited amount of resources, meaning money, yep. to put in stuff, right? Yeah. And I think they they really are looking they're looking for filmmakers that are for real, that that actually have skin in the game, that have a stake in what they're doing. So that first movie that you do, and you made your first movie, you know, it's like, and you have to, as a rite of passage, you have to get that out of the way. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, Ham and Cheese was that sort of reaction to everybody saying, no, you can't make a $4 million movie, Warren. You've never made a movie before. Yeah. And it's like, well, I've made, you know, at that time, however many videos. And they're like, it doesn't matter. If you add them up. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, it, it, you know, filmmaking is very inclusive. I still think filmmaking as, a, as an industry is one of those industries which is the most inclusive, where you can show up on set with absolutely no training, no skill, no anything, but if you just have tenacity, you can work in the film industry. Mm. You will find a way to figure out what you want to do. And I don't think a lot of industries are like that. But film is a niche industry in that once you establish yourself as a thing, as a as a as a as a brand or as a as a this is what you do, yeah. people will will put you in that slot, you know. And when you want to branch out of that from say being a music video director into a feature film director, there's, there's that reticence and there's that pushback. And, and it should be there because not everybody should be doing it. And, and you should be questioned yeah. why you want to do it. And um, uh, ham and cheese was definitely uh, uh, an exercise or an experiment. Or even just like we had to do it. Yeah. You know, I had to make a movie. That's why I got into the whole business to begin with. So. And now you've, made, you've done, what, like 10 films in 10 years? I've done, I'll take 10, but I really, I've done nine. Nine? Yeah. But you've got... Is it Jake joins a cult? Is, is coming in, out? Is in development, yeah. yeah. And hopefully we will do that in the fall when everything comes together. So, nice. Yeah. yeah. So it's been a good run. I mean, um, there's a, I'm, I'm part of a group of filmmakers that actually, we, we make a lot of movies, which is great. You know, we were talking just before we started filming this about Ingrid Vinegar doing yeah. her, her film. And um, there's, there's some great stuff being done right now. And... Um, you know, we were talking about Molly Maxwell and, mm-hmm. and Sarah's movie and how I just thought that was a perfect... That's like, it's it's our Pretty in Pink or this, it could be this generation's Pretty in Pink, you know? Yeah, it's an like, amazing, it's like, it's it's like a non-overly quirky Juno, too, in a way. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. Very, very, very well put together and well, very well made, made with love. Um, you know, you can you can understand the the budget limitations they were under um, but to, you don't to feel make it, but you don't feel it at all. No. At all. You watch it as a movie. No. Like and it's... and I think that's a great indication of where Canadian filmmakers are going. More yeah. accessible, more just 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 really wonderful storytelling. 
So hopefully. 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 We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> I hear your sex after kids is like that, so. Yeah. Well, you have to see. Was, was, that, was that experience kind of like the same thing where you just had to get that movie made because no one, no one else was going to let you make your $100 million? Yeah, it was something like that was my second film. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just a situation where I had had another film that was close to getting getting made and it just fell apart. Right. And, it was, and it was the same thing. It was like a lot of people, it was after like, my first film, very similar to Hammer and Cheese in the sense that it was like it was a fake documentary. Right. Uh, and, and I had a lot of people say, it's like, well, you made a movie, but you didn't really make a real movie. Right. It's like well, it's, right. It, it has and they said that after Cooper's too, because it was it was such a, a found footage, found footage sort of thing. But I think I think now it's part of the lexicon. It's part of you know, yeah. People get the it. Office is, was did but, nine I mean, seasons. And I look at the Office and like I, you know, I, and then I look at Ham and Cheese. I'm like, we were kind of ahead of the curve. Yeah. Right, where the comedy, absolutely. comedy was starting to go. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because uh, I was absolutely ignorant of. Um, you know, the BBC at that point in my life. So. Oh, she had the same American <laughs> one, yeah. Or oh, the British one. So, yeah. yeah, and so for me, the second one, Six Act for Kids was more a reaction of, well, I'm not going to wait for someone else to tell me right. um, that when, I can... When you can make a movie. Yeah. yeah, and so I just went went to crowdfunding because yeah. I knew I could probably raise enough to do what I needed to do with right. it. And I hadn't, I didn't think I had enough experience, not an extra experience, but enough credentials to go to telefilm yet right. and that kind of stuff. Um because I know that it's all about building the right package. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was just like, let me get one more out of the way mm-hmm. um, and try to make something that's even more... Because, I mean, the problem with my first film is the untitled work of Paul Shepard is a terrible title. <laughs> I love it. it. It works really well for the movie once right. you've seen it. Right. But as like an advertising title... As a Netflix title, maybe? It's not a good title. Not only that, you start under U. Yeah, you start under U <laughs> or, or T. Either right. way, you're at the end. Well, that's what they did with the uh, My Awkward Sexual Yeah, picture. they turned an N. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they made it an A. And, so, uh, yeah, and, of course, Sexual Adventure, just for Netflix. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so the you second one was the reaction of, like, make something that's absolutely accessible, mm-hmm. and, and there we are. Yeah. Hmm. Want to do some questions? Sure. Is this, do I have to, this is where I take my clothes off? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, let's roll this. Let's talk yeah. about this. Oh, let's, let's talk about our pain. Yeah. Well, Todd, Todd, I, Todd in the book of pure evil. Oh, I just met Craig and Andrew last week because we did Amazing an, an Indiegogo campaign uh, panel together. Oh, do you, okay. Yeah. Because they're doing. Yeah, the, they did their very successful uh, animated Indiegogo, which uh, they probably um, still need money for because you never can have enough money to make these things. No, and you and you did two episodes of the of season two, and loved it. If if anybody is, has not seen Todd in the uh, Book of Pure Evil, please go right now. I think it's on iTunes. You can buy both seasons. Yeah, it's I don't think it's on Netflix. Netflix, get your ass and get it. <laughs> and, and get it. Um, but it 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 really was. I just think it's the best show on. It's so TV. good. If you have any kind of like predilection to what you think like Canadian comedies Comedy is, can be, yeah. watch Todd in the Book yeah, of Pure Evil. Yeah, because I mean it's it's all from the the twisted mind of. Craig David Wallace and he um, had spent years and years and years putting the, the the story together, the scripts together, the television show came out of his short film yep. that he did at the CFC, and um, it was just a great experience. And we 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 were like, I really felt we were knocking it out of the park that season, and then we didn't get picked up for season three, which sucked on so many levels. Yeah, it's like it's how do you it, uh, because because not yeah. only. You know, and I've said this before. It's like I'm not just a director of the show. I'm a fan of it. I yeah. want to know what happens to Hannah and, and, and everybody on it. And like it, it ends on such a cliffhanger, um, uh, just like a, oh my god, what's just happened? That I want to know where the story goes. And I really felt that uh, uh, just thematically and, and the way their narrative was going, they really came into their own in that second season and hit that stride. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how... R.I.P. Todd. R. I. P. But long live the animated Todd, because yeah. uh, that's going to be fantastic. Are you looking to do more TV stuff? Uh, yeah, I would love to. I mean, I would love to continue doing what I'm doing, which is like, you know, do a movie every year-ish, maybe, and then and then in the off time, do the episodics to... Yeah. to how do, I mean, how do you get so many projects going? That's one thing I'm curious about, because you, you, you're you not working nonstop, which is amazing. Um, 
you know, I, I've been asked this quite a bit, and I've I've told like twelve different answers. But I think I think and they all end in you sold your souls. Yes, it all ends with me naked <laughs> at a table in front of web cameras. I'm okay to do that. <laughs> I'm. Um, you know, I I think it's because ham and cheese. When I made that film, uh, I didn't write it, hmm. and uh, the as I as I started making films, I started getting scripts that I really liked to, to make, whether it be textuality or servitude or, or you know, uh, Cooper's camera, puck hogs. Uh, so scripts started to find me as a director. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of my friends are auteurs. They're, they're pure auteurs. They're, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. artists. They have a style. They have, a, a, they have themes they want to talk about. They have stories that they want to um, get through. But for me, I'm I'm looking I'm looking to just tell really good stories. Yeah. And whether it comes from me or I write it, and I've only written um, uh, how many? Two. I've written two of the films that I've made: uh, Five Girls and Unrivaled, which were both straight to video. They were supposed to be both straight to video pieces of shit. And I think I mean I'm biased, but I think they're just. They're not about that was the goal to make them straight video people. That was that was that was that was the that was the bare minimum. That was okay. that was the landing. Pattern. You're not going to get worse than it that. was was not going to be worse than a piece of shit straight to video. Five girls was a was a casting one favorite by the way. There you go, yeah. five girls. That's right, we Especially did that. Especially for casting. Yeah, Marjorie and, and we were at uh, um, at that. It was on Young Street, right? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Behind the scenes, right there is our, our webmaster. Yeah, right there, um, and. Uh, it's funny because I do look at something like Five Girls on Unrivaled, which was a mixed martial arts <laughs> QFC fighter movie. Um, which when I hear that, I think, yeah, we should get Sonoda to get do that. But at the time, I wanted to do an action film. Yeah. I wanted to figure out how to Flex do those fights. Muscles. Yeah, yeah, it's like we had four of the top UFC fighters, and we beat the shit out of them. It was fantastic. Over repeatedly, and and I was and I was able uh, on that to be able to rewrite the script that I was given and on Five Girls just kind of write from scratch. And I, I look at those two things and it's like, they're kind of the most personal films of mine even though they're kind of direct to DVD, VOD, um, B movies. Uh, because, uh, you know, they're, they're, my fingerprints are in them. Yeah. But uh, when, you know, when I do something like Swearnet or Cooper's, it's like my fingerprints are in it in a different way. Yeah. Where I'm, I'm serving the scripts. I'm serving the story that we're all trying to tell, and um, uh, that's probably how I've been able to make as many movies as I have. Is because I've, I've been very fortunate to work with really great writers and, and producers, multiple producers. Because I don't produce myself. Yeah. If I had to produce, did you produce Sex After Kids? Yeah, yeah. So co-produced, yeah, right? Yeah. So you know what it's like. Yeah. It's like you're still working on that movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And if I had to do that on every single one of my films, I would have made. Two movies now, right? Maybe three. Yeah, um, but I've been fortunate, you know, to go on that run where um, I, I I would I just got a lot of material and and a lot of it was in the wheelhouse and people wanted to see it get made and we made it. Nice. You know, and, and hopefully that will continue. Good on you. <laughs> All right, let's do some five questions. So pull one out. You got to pull it out and yeah. hand it to me because I might have to modify it. All right, because it might be in Arabic or something. It might be in Arabic. Okay. I can translate well. All right. My best friend's Farsi, so. If you, oh, you've been. Are these from, Jesus, like, I where are these from? These you, are uh, my, you know, my, my brain. brain. <laughs> I went down to Young Shit. I asked the guy that sells pens in the yes, beach. Yes, Yeah. A uh, little beach yes. humor for the or, or the, or the Or the sunglass guy right at the corner of uh, Young and Dundas. He's sunglasses. He's always so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so if you had to take an animated film that's already been made and remake it in live action, what film would you choose? Oh, wow. Budgets, whatever. Through the roof. Wow. Um, that is an interesting question I've never been asked before. Look at me. Um, animated. Animated. You know, what I would love to do, I, you know, and, and they've kind of done this. They did this shortly after, but I would love to do heavy metal as a movie. Yeah? Uh, not specifically the stories they did in, in the... I'm talking about the first Heavy Metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Ryman one. But um, there's some really great... And I guess I guess Prometheus is like that. 
Like, they've done it. <laughs> Fucking done it. They've done the idea already. Yeah, right. so, That's a lame answer. So There's no good deal. I don't know. Beauty and the Beast. How's that? Beauty and the Beast. They've done, they've done live action. I don't know. Fuck, I don't know. But the, not with the music. Not with the singing. You know, I, I think animation is its own thing. It's It would be hard to, like, you know... Uh, the line's blurring. What would I do with Ratatouille that you didn't do in the, you know, maybe... What? Dress people up in... Rat in rat costumes? costumes? <laughs> You'd still use a <laughs> rat. Just, That's just it. I'm making this... Well, the beauty, of, cuisine. the beauty of animation is that you get to go into a world you usually it's can't. True. Yeah. Hear, you know, that's right? a lame question. I'm sorry. Wow. Sorry. That was, that's, that's, it go should be animated. One, it should just be animated. We should just keep it animated. But you could go, like, you could say... Because I defer to the animators. I defer to those Fair artists. Enough. Because they're so should great. Should I rip that question up? Maybe. I'll do it for you. Don't burn it, because you're going to set off, like, 16 fire. I'm not going to burn just saying, don't rip it up. I'll leave it in there, just in case. Just in case. If another person tells me it's a stupid question, I'll take it out. It's not stupid. It's just, it's just. I feel bad. I would For feel, me? I, no, I feel, I feel bad to any animator that I take their story away and I try to fuck it up. You know what they did? They um. I oh, you, did you recently. write that question? Maybe, probably. Well, then you probably have have an answer. What would be yours? I don't go fuck. Don't make me do that. Uh, you know what I just saw recently that I didn't realize until halfway through that it was a remake was the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Okay. Yeah. Nick Cage, Jay Baruchel, yeah, yeah. which is essentially a, a remake of Fantasia. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize until happened through the movie that he starts like making like the mops and buckets clean <laughs> and stuff, and, and that scene only exists because right. they're trying to pay homage to right. that. But um, again, not quite a right. retelling. You know what animated movie I'd like to do as a live action movie? Battleship. Battleship. That's a joke. That's a joke. But I'm out there, right? Get it? Because it's yeah, got right. it. CGI. Yeah. And, all right, we'll do another yeah, one. Right. We're, gonna, we're gonna move on from. But you know, in Battleship, I was really impressed with how they actually incorporated Battleship into Battleship. I haven't the game. seen it yet. I'm waiting for it to you come out. You are missing out. Let me Aww. tell you, Rihanna can do everything on a battleship. She could be every. She could be the communications officer. She could be like. Uh, she can go on point for the. Was away Rihanna team. in Battleship? She was. I remember. Alexander she did everything on that ship. It. Yeah. There you go. How did your mom and dad meet? Um. These are personal questions. You don't have to answer. You can skip if you want. Uh, my mom, mom and dad met um, uh, in Hamilton, and uh, they went to at high the school together. Yeah, we had the movie pals. You know, it probably would have would have been around. <laughs> they went to high school together, and um, um, he courted her, and it was uh, beautiful. He cornered her, or he courted her? <laughs> he courted her. He courted her. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you see, uh, courted her yeah. as they would have done back in the um, the olden days, and uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's as much it. as I know, yeah. As interesting as that gets. That's it, yeah. I'll move on, I guess. Right. <laughs> We're burning through. Right. You don't have kids, do you? No. This one will not. Wow, face. we are no, like... We won't count that one. Really? That one doesn't count. All right. I can pretend I have a kid. No, it won't work. Okay. I'll, I'll be able to tell you're lying, I have two, so... Oh, really? No. I've been lying since I got here, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. What's your favorite movie that most people hate? Or like a oh, guilty wow. pleasure movie? Oh, guilty pleasure movies? I have a bunch of them. You know what, what movie I, I really love watching is uh, The Core. I do, the I do, core I do. of the earth has stopped moving and we have to go back in and set off nuclear weapons to start it back up one. again. That's Piper Parabou, isn't that right? Piper Parabou? No, uh, Hilary Swank. Way off. Oh, I'm thinking of a different movie. Yes, I'm thinking of you're life. thinking of... Um, uh, Coyote Ugly. No, it's not Coyote Ugly. It's like it's her, it's her, the only reason. The heart of this of this strip club has stopped moving, and we have, we have to, to go into the restaurant and restart, restart it. Um, and Stanley Tucci just tears it up it's in the core. Fanta- it's fantastic. So it's like Armageddon inside the earth. Inside the earth, yeah. Uh, and uh, absolutely ridiculous. Um, bad movies. Bad movies. Um, yeah, I guess I, geez, the core. That's a good answer. The core. Yeah. I actually watch it a lot. I've, you know, every every couple of years, I'll put it. You on. pop it in. I pop it in. Do you have certain movies when um, when you're getting ready to to make something? Do you like go back and re-reference things? Absolutely. In fact, um, I just I just posted something about this last year on Facebook about because uh, we were prepping for Swearnet and um, I was talking about um, getting ready for to, to do films. And I, I do. I, there's a, there's a, a certain list of films. I, I can't watch all of them. Yeah. And not all of them are applicable, but even if they're not applicable, I'll watch it just to remember what good filmmaking is. Mm. And um, um, uh, Big Night is one of my favorite Big films. Big Night's great. Um, uh, Tootsie, I will watch time and again. Uh, Carnal Knowledge. Oh, fuck, um, I love Carnal Knowledge. So good. 
um, Ordinary People. Um, I'm forgetting a bunch. Um, uh, Walking and Talking. Uh, the Nicole Hall Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there is, there is, there, there, I have, you know, probably about 20 films that I will kind of just sit Mine down. Mine are very similar. I, there's a couple of those that I, it's... You know, then you all throw in a Raiders of the Lost Ark or an E.T. or, you know, a Star Wars or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll watch an ordinary people to, to understand how to make human connections and, and tell that kind of story, even if I'm doing something like Swear Night, which... You know, you would think totally doesn't different. have any, but there's a you know the spine or the backbone, and and when you're telling a story about you know four best friends, you want to watch something like Stand by Me and see what they do, yeah, you know, to to strengthen those those connections. So yeah, for sure. I wonder we don't. I, I, I this is the bigger conversation, but I always fear that we don't have like we're not making those kind of touchstone films that like that you're referencing right now. Or, or I think we just, do. I they, mean, I'm not saying that we are not. It's just they're not getting the weight or the attention that those ones. Well, do. I mean, that that are you talking about Canadian films? No, I'm, I mean in general. Oh, in, ge- in general, movie. Yeah, characters. it's just. Like, I mean, it just seems like movies just come in, they come out, and like how many of them are, are ones that are really going to be oh, classics? Oh, uh, you know, um, Soderbergh just had his keynote address at the yeah. San Francisco um, Film Festival, and he talked about this, where it's expendable, mm-hmm. and and what. Not to be confused with the Expendables. No, not to, which is you know, but Expendable in itself. Um, and it's it it all has to do with the fact that there's now seven billion people on the planet, yeah. not four, and things move incredibly oh. fast. And um, you know, if it if it doesn't if it doesn't light it up in that first weekend, it's gone the yeah. second weekend. And because we live in this society that's all consumption based. And there's and, so much stuff. And, and how do you and, wade through it? And there's there's no time to ruminate. There's no time to like let something seek in and let it find its way. And um, and that's just the way the world's built now. Well, everyone wants to get their voice heard, and technically everyone can now. Yeah. You know, so it's like how do you? Well, even you, you know, I was just in Queen Video yesterday, um, looking for something to watch, and this is the amount of independent films out there that um, there's three categories. Ones I've heard, and I want to see. Ones I kind of heard kind of about, but not they quite sound sure. And then there's this whole other mass of like, oh, so I've never heard of this movie before. And I consider myself someone that actually has my yeah, puts an effort in. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I daily I, I make an effort to figure out what's going on out there. And there's just too much product to keep up with with what's going on. And that's fine. That's the world we live in. Yeah. But I think what you're talking about is a collective moment where everybody saw Breakfast Club and yeah. know exactly what that is. Movies like that. Like or that. say anything and when you know people put the ghetto blaster above their heads they, they know what that moment means to them. Yeah, the, there's a few I mean they come out but it, I, I'm thinking of like the most recent ones that I can think of are stuff like Little Miss Sunshine. Little Miss Sunshine, The Hangover. The Hangover. You know, People forget the Hangover. The first one's so it, well, it's brilliant, and yeah. but no one knew it was going to be what it is. No, they, it was a complete surprise. They were, you know, even the filmmakers were like, Fuck, I, we think this is funny, but we don't yeah. know. And then it just became because it was really, really great storytelling. Well, it went out there. They just they, they threw everything at the wall, yeah. and and it was great. And then they turned it into a franchise. But, but I think I think the movie going experience now is so um, can be so individual. Um, it's it's really up to you to, you know, life moves so fast. Mm. That's why YouTube is there because you can watch something or Upworthy. You know, it's yeah. like I got five minutes. Let me be inspired. Yeah, give you me know? give me give me your best of that. I got five minutes. And me. when you when you when you when you boil everything down to between thirty seconds and five minutes, um, you can only experience so much. And God love the people at Upworthy because they actually find things that actually for bite-sized material are worth can, checking can, yeah, out. Yeah, can, you can really check out. But it starts to condition you to uh, receive content that way. Mm. And whether we like it or not, that's what, you know, do you have kids? Yeah. Yeah, sex advocates, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your kids, that's, that's your kids. Your well, kids will be bite-sized material made for them. Yeah. Um, whether we like it or not. Well, my son's four, and like the other day we talked about walking down to like we live near the film buff in East End. So I was mm-hmm. like, well, let's, we should walk down and see what they got. Uh, and I said, well, this is what I used to do when I was a kid. We used to walk to the video store. He said, why don't you just go on Netflix? And I'm like, <laughs> it's like how far are we gone? It's true, this? but here's the thing: it's like we didn't because we didn't have Netflix. Uh, you know, when, when we were growing up, 
independent filmmakers had no avenue yep, to absolutely. get their stuff out. Absolutely. So, you know, um, Chris Booth makes a film like At Home By Myself With You. And, you know, 20 years ago, who would have saw it? Well, it's, and even if it's at the video store, it's yeah. like, who's going to pick it up? Who's yeah. going to risk their 4 to $8? So there's a mechanism home? now for um, uh, filmmakers, especially in this country and in this city, and I consider myself one of them, where we have platforms and, and ways to get films out there. And you know what, it, it really is. Like, it comes, there comes a point in your career where it's like, you don't care anymore about budgets or money or any of that. You care. I mean, yeah. you obviously care. I care. Uh, care you know, you want, you want to pay rent, you want Turn to be a around. citizen. You want, yeah, you want to be a citizen of this planet and everything. But yeah. what you really care about is, is eyeballs. You, yeah. you want people to see this thing that you've spent the last, you know, at least Michael Spraga yeah. wrote Servitude, the first draft, in 1999. The guy's been working on this thing for over, you know, over a decade. Yeah. So when you make a movie and you put so much time and effort into it, and a lot of the times when I do a film, I'll come in at the very end stage yeah. when it's just about ready to go and, and um, kind, of, kind of make it. But there's people, either the writer or producers, who've been developing this thing. So far before. First, yeah. Who have put so much time and work into it, and then you make a movie, and you just want eyeballs on it. Yeah. You don't, you don't necessarily care how they get on it. I'm not, I'm not advocating the the BitTorrent sites and everything, but you want, you want things like Netflix, you want VOD, you want, yeah, um, a day and date, because whether we like it or not, exhibition is slowly becoming a niche market. It's becoming a tentpole market, yeah. and. And thank God for places like the Lightbox and the Bloor Cinema and the Royal, which is like my favorite cinema in town, for playing independent films. But you're still just looking at 50 people coming out yeah. and watching your movie, well, which is great because yeah. that's the experience of it. And you you're, you make your film partly for that. But, you know, at the same time, you put something on YouTube and you can actually see the, you know, 1.2 million hits that you get on. Yeah, and then and, and the reality is that it's like to release an independent film in, in the theaters is you're only going to hit major cities at best. Yeah. So it's like all the people in the on the offspring don't yeah. get a chance, right? Yeah. Edward Burns had a really uh, interesting comment about talking about how you know in the '90s um, when the the boom of the independent film was happening, people would, there was a lot of there's more cinemas first of all. Yes. Uh, and so a lot of pe people would go. People would go. That's what they would do. Um, but he says now those people that used to go there, they all have giant screen television. Giant screens where they do this. They just watch, yeah. like kids watch stuff on their so iPhones. Those, and they, those people have kids or whatever, or they're just not going out the way they used right. to. So he says, so why? Well, I mean, it's expensive now. It's like a hundred bucks to go out to see a movie. By the time you get a babysitter yeah. and yeah. Parking. So yeah. what he was saying is like, why fight to try to force them to come see the movie there when you can deliver it right to where they're watching yeah. it anyway? Yeah. And I was like, you know, he says, you know, basically not to say that it, it's dead, but he says, you know, filmmakers like us have to get over the romanticism of theatrical. And the ego. And, and, the, and the ego and the pride of it. That yeah. if, if my film doesn't screen the theater, it's not a real film. Yeah. Um, and I think, and that's something that I had to really, really think about. With, with Sex After Kids. Just in general, I mean, Sex After Kids for me too, just knowing that it was like, it was the kind of film that... Um, was going to be parents are going to see it. So it's like, I know me, it's hard for me to get her to go to see a movie. Right. So right. it's like, I for me, it was like, I wanted to make sure it played festivals and got some mm -hmm. attention and hopefully gets a small theatrical release. Right. But for me, it was more about like making sure it's there for parents to be able to watch right. at home. Right. Because that's where they're going to, that's, that's where our demographic is going to yeah. be. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think that's the lessons that we're all learning right now is theatrical now is such a small, Unless you're making something that has a machine behind it, like I'm hoping SwearNet is that thing for me that breaks through finally. Yeah, well, you've got the trailer park guys. And yeah, and and there's there's a lot of uh, good feeling behind it. I think it's a very funny film, and 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 I hopefully can't wait to see you know it. hopefully it it gets that you know we get the across Canada big release. But when you're looking at something like Cooper's, where it was very small and made with our own hands and we're putting it out on you know five or seven screens across Canada, and you have to take the care of releasing it. Um, you know, you really have to go. Okay, well, are we doing this to make ourselves feel better as yeah. filmmakers, and maybe get the you know handful of people, thousands of people that are going to go see it, see it? Um, because what you really want is that million 
eyeball view, you know, of your of your film, and that that is the internet, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Sorry, I guess I know it's okay. I was listening. There's so many. I, I cared about seven dancing it. girls just went there. by in full Los and Angeles I didn't look into the room. outfits, <laughs> and I yeah, it's like it happens all the time, and I'm like, what is going on here? Uh, oh, we have two more questions. All right, all right. I'm not, I've been I've been flaming out. I hope this is good. No, no, this is good. What, what? Well, actually, one we couldn't even talk about. So this one doesn't work either. This is more oh, an actor geez, question. Really? Well, what is it? I can be an actor. You gonna try? What is it? Okay. The question is: You get cast in a buddy movie with any actor. It can be someone alive or from the past. Who is it? Uh, you, yeah. you use that. Well, why don't you say if you were to cast a buddy movie and you could have any two actors? Apricots and flamingos. That doesn't... Um, if if I if I could cast two actors. Alive or dead in a buddy comedy, who would you pick? Oh, you know what? I just had a dream about this, uh, and I just posted this dream on Facebook. I just had a dream. You can record your dreams. I have recorded my yes. You could be making so much money. I know, I know, but yeah, it's, it's really low resolution. Oh, okay. It's like it's just standard definition. <laughs> um, uh, I had a dream that I was uh, blocking a scene. It was a comedy with Steve Carell and Melissa McCarthy. That's a but but here's the thing. That's not the buddy movie that I want to make. And we were... I, I vividly remember it was like a big, long, um, underwater causeway. And there was a walk and talk. And it was it was just absolutely deadly because there's this exposition. They were talking yeah. about what's going to happen next. I like that you dream an exposition. That's yeah, nice. and like it's like it was a dolly move. And I had another camera just covering close-ups. And I'm like, oh, this scene is so fucking deadly. It's not, it's not working. So I turn. <laughs> and standing there is Ryan Robbins and Tony Napo. Who are two of my favorite uh, actors in this country? Ryan Robbins was in. Uh, they were they were both in Unrivaled, uh, uh, the action movie that. I yeah. Made. And Ryan's from um, Vancouver. Tony is lives here, and uh, two of my favorite actors ever. And they were on set. I, I don't think it was their scene in the movie. They're just hanging out watching. Krell and uh, Melissa do their thing, and I turn to them like, "Listen, can you go in and, and pretend to be like bad guys and really fuck them up?" <laughs> and um, they did, and it was hilarious. So the the buddy the buddy movie I would do is Tony Napa and Ryan Robbins. Um, I think, and I posted that on Facebook, and and uh, Ryro Ryan said, uh, "It's going to be a new movie called Dream Thugs. Uh, we will we'll get you." Only in your dreams. That's great. You've got like you can do like a Monsters Inc. kind of thing exactly, with, with Freddy yeah. Krueger. You yeah, do that for sure. So that's Dream that's thugs. my buddy movie, Dream Thugs, with uh, um, Ryan Robbins and uh, Tony Napo, the two of Canada's best uh, actors. You should do that. Yeah. And you got another question in your hand. Right. You bundle. Look, you just oh. bundle them up. These yeah. things go back in. God damn it. Origami. Man. It's a it's Asian, <laughs> Asian flair. Did you have a childhood nickname? Uh, I had yes. I have two nicknames. One from my childhood and one from my um, uh, beginnings as a filmmaker. Uh, my family, my brothers, and my dad call me Tiger. Tiger? Tiger. So if you're actually walking down the street and you yell at Tiger, I'll actually respond You'll to turn? you. Yeah. Because it's, okay. it's like... It's it ingrained. Doesn't, it doesn't even face me anymore. Um, that was a cute little kid. I was like, Tiger. <laughs> um, and then uh, when I started at Black Walk, I was the youngest filmmaker there. I think I was 21 when I started there. And um, Stephen Scott, who is uh, one of my, he's one of my mentors, one of the filmmakers that I've always uh, gravitated towards. Mm -hmm. He was very, he was, a, he was the senior director there when I started, so I learned a lot from him. He uh, nicknamed me the Kid. So for the better part of the '90s, they would just call me the Kid. Hey Kid, hey Kid, hey here's the Kid. Well, you're like Robert Evans. They called they called him the Kid too, right? Yeah. Didn't they? Yeah. Uh, I don't nearly do as much drug or plastic surgery as Robert, as Robert Evans, Evans. Yeah. but you know, yeah. so you couldn't be the Canadian Robert Evans. I don't. Well, I'm not a producer. <laughs> I'm not. I, oh, fair we, enough. I mean, we know the Canadian Robert Evans that are out there, but I won't, I won't name them on no, this. No, we don't need to do that because I still want to work. In yeah, <laughs> and maybe with them. Right. Yes. So um, those were my nicknames. Did you have a nickname? Uh, I had a nickname. I played football in high school, and they called me Big Dog. Big Dog. Huh? That's pretty good. That's good yeah. in the bedroom now. <laughs> yeah, that's you know? what I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it down. I say home. I wouldn't want the kid in in the bed. Maybe tiger. Tiger, tiger the kid. No, no the not kid. The tiger kid, tiger. tiger. You don't want either of those. Hey, yeah, lose that. Hey tiger. Hey big. Hey dog. tiger. Hey big dog. Throw some. Throw me a bone. Jesus. You know something like that. This is this this is gonna end a little bit differently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how do we end? Uh -huh. 
is you have two choices. You either have to display. Some <laughs> kind a, of, there's a sword and a gun. There's a sword and a gun. <laughs> you have to dis, you have to either display some kind of talent oh that you can do, I have or no talent, or we have to arm wrestle. I will arm wrestle you. I'm not I, good. I clearly don't have any talent. And this is really. Do you arm wrestle everybody? If they just started it? from uh, an actor, my first a podcast guest was Tommy Amber Peary. Um, she's an actor. Okay. And she, I said, I don't know how to end this thing, and she, that's what she suggested. An arm wrestle. So now it's become a bit of a tradition. Wow. Do you? Do more, most people choose an arm wrestle? It's. You know what? I, I'd have to go through, but I think it's like 50-50. 50-50. What yeah. kind of talents do you show? Tara Spencer Nairn can play ping pong with herself. No. Just what, her did, voice. She, did she? Oh, with her voice. No, she does like. It's <laughs> like this. Does Tara carry around a ping pong? No, no, no. She just like does this like, like Tara. You have talents that we don't know. About. Yeah, she does this. She's this, a fantastic actress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't work, wait to work with her. She's lovely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so she did that, and then just some other one guy did this magic trick where he twisted his arm around. Matt Austin. <laughs> Matt Austin did can, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt Sadowski. Matt, he is okay with both. Really? Yeah. Because he said Sadowski when I when I saw him. He forced you to. No, I asked him. I was polite about it. I'm like Matt. Listen, I want to get this right. Yeah, you know what? I I feel like we're more than just Facebook friends. We're friends for life. Yeah. I want to get this right. What's your name? And he said Sadowski. Now I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. Well, there we go. Because Matt Austin sounds like um, a, a, well, a bionic figure. It sounds like a Power Ranger. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Steve Austin's younger son, (laughs) Matt Austin. And now we're just prolonging. Are you ready? You look at your. You got. I'm not gonna. You got the fucking forearms of, of an elephant. Of an editor. That's like <laughs> I, I, the forearms of an editor. Are you? Are, are we really for sure? Like like your full. You want to do a thumb wrestle instead? No, I can. Okay. I don't have a wrestle. But is this for real? I'm not gonna hurt, try to hurt you. That's not the goal. Okay. Although some people come at me pretty hard. And I okay, can, so you should say you when you go. Say, give us a three, two, one. Three, two, one. Oh, gee. see, that was this one. Hypo weren't went for it. The. Oh, he let me. I didn't. You know what? He let me win, just for the record. Well, we'll say that. You, you also, you know what? The yeah, just he, he had the height. He could have easily. My problem is I don't start strong. Really? And that's that's what you really do. If you get the upper hand in the first second, right. I think that's. I learned a little bit about armor because I have an arm of, a, of an editor too, and it's yeah. just you know. So you got the two, you know, you know. Is it's it's twelve one? Is that our time? Are we good? I guess we gotta go. Do you have enough shit? Yeah, there's enough. We've got <laughs> enough shit. In there. there might be some good stuff in there as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank well, you for, for coming. On, thanks buddy. for having me. Yeah. Uh, if you like the show, like us on Facebook. And if you want me to throw any questions in the jar, just post it on the Facebook wall and. and we'll do sure. That. Maybe. Uh, maybe not one of my stupid. Maybe ones. Maybe not stupid ones. Yeah. Maybe don't do that. <laughs> see ya. All right. All right see ya.